good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming out. I'm glad to see lots of people who are enjoying being with each other. That's a, a good sign on any night. I'm Tom Landy. I'm the director of the McFarland Center for Religion, Ethics, and Culture at the College of the Holy Cross, and I'm glad to be here tonight. Uh, one of the McFarland Center's responsibilities, or I should say joys, is that we get to coordinate programming for the Kraft Hyatt Program for Jewish Christian Understanding. That uh, was established through the generosity of the Kraft and Hyatt families, uh, and we're able to sponsor through that lectures, discussions, uh, performances that focus on Jewish history, contemporary Judaism, and Jewish Christian relations. We're also able to send faculty and students occasionally to uh, Israel, which is something we're happy to do, uh, to study the Holocaust and Jewish culture. In the last two years, we've been able to partner with Israeli Stage in Bo from Boston to bring their programs to Holy Cross. Last year, the troupe gave a performance of Oh God here at the college, uh, which I was traveling for, but I have only heard great things about. Um, today, we're really pleased to welcome Israeli Stage's 2017 playwright in residence, uh, Yeshua uh, Sobel. We're also grateful to have uh, Guy Ben Aharon, uh, pro producing artistic director of the Israeli Stage, who's here tonight. Uh, he's gonna help us with the Q&A after Yeshua's talk, and we are recording tonight's event as well, so if you see friends and say you missed something good, uh, in a couple of days it'll be online and they can uh, see what's here on our website, holycross.edu slash McFarland Center. Uh, Yeshua Sobel is a uh, prolific and award-winning playwright, director, and author. He's written over 75 plays and directed productions in Germany, Austria, Switzerland, Israel, and the United States. His most famous play, Ghetto, about Jewish theater in Vilna, uh, the ghetto in Lithuania during Nazi occupation in World War II, is part of a triptych of plays about the resistance movement. It's been performed in 24 countries and has won more than a dozen, than a dozen awards. He's won five David's Harp Awards for the best Israeli play and won the Israeli Theater Association Award for Lifetime Achievement. He's been awarded the Golden Medal of the City of Vienna for Excellent Achievement in 2014. In Tel Aviv, he's directing a production, he told us a little bit about that tonight, of The Merchant of Venice, set at the height of Mussolini's fascist regime. If you're not heading to Israel anytime soon, you can see uh, Yeshua's work at the Boston University's Theater Lab at 855, where his play Sinners runs from March 23rd to April 2nd, and Israeli stage will sponsor a staged reading of his new play, David, King at Wellesley College, April 5th. Uh, his wife Edna is here with us. We're very pleased to have her as well. So please join me in welcoming Yeshua Sobel. Uh, thank you so much for introducing me. Uh, I will uh, talk about the, uh, uh, the genesis of uh, my play Ghetto, or the trilogy of the, uh, the Ghetto trilogy, or the Ghetto triptych, as I called it. Uh, three plays that uh, deal with the various aspects of life in the Vilna ghetto, the ghetto of Vilnius. Uh, Vilnius is the uh, capital of uh, Lithuania. Um, the three plays are Ghetto, uh, Adam, and Underground. Um, uh, well, uh, what made me write these plays, it, it was a footnote in a, in a book about the uh, uh, underground movement, the resistance uh, in the Vilna ghetto. Uh, the book was written by a member of the uh, resistance movement in the ghetto. Um, and uh, in a footnote in the book, she mentioned the, th uh, the fact that a theater started to function in the ghetto of Vilnius, and it created a controversy in the, in the ghetto, and that the uh, partisans movement, the resistance was opposed to the foundation and to the activity of the theater. And they wrote on the walls of the, of the houses of the ghetto, uh, or they put posters saying, uh, you, one should not play theater or no theater in a graveyard. Meaning that the ghetto and the life in the ghetto was similar to life in a graveyard. Um, so they were opposed to the, cre the, cre to the foundation of the theater, to the founding of the theater, and to its activity. Uh, I have to say a few words about the, uh, the history of the Jews of, Vilni of Vilna. Before the war, Vilna uh, 
uh, as I said, the capital of Lithuania counted some 150,000 inhabitants. Half of the population were Jew uh, Jews. Uh, there were like 25% Lithuanians and 25% of Polish uh, uh, descent. So the Jewish minority or the Jewish uh, uh, chunk was the biggest one in the population of Vilnius. And uh, not only were they uh, the biggest uh, um, group in the population, the biggest ethnic group, uh, uh, the Jewish population counted about 75,000 uh, people. But it was also traditionally a center of uh, Jewish culture. Uh, in Vilnius, uh, in the uh, 19th century, was, uh, uh, the, the uh, Babylonian Talmud was published there, printed there, the famous uh, edition. Then the Bund movement, the, which was a socialist revolutionary uh, Jewish movement that um, um, uh, developed a kind, uh, an ideology which said that the Jewish uh, proletarian, proletariat should participate in the struggle uh, and the revolution which will take place in various European countries. And after the installation Inspiration of a socialist regime, uh, the Jewish population will demand, or the, the Jewish proletariat will uh, demand and uh, ask for a, a cultural and linguistic autonomy. Uh, Yiddish being the language, the language of the of the Jewish population, and so there should be a, 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 a cultural autonomy for Yiddish culture. Now, what happened in Lithuania, yeah, and as I said, the Bund started there, this, uh, this uh, revolutionary uh, uh, Yiddish um, party. Other parties were very active in the uh, political arena in, in Vilnius. There were Zionists, there were socialist Zionists, there were revisionists who uh, belonged to the right-wing uh, Zionist movement. All, and there were communists, of course, uh, and all these parties uh, were very active. They issued uh, uh, pr their own press and so on in two languages, in Yiddish and also in Hebrew. There was a high school, a, gym a gymnasium in Vilnius called Tarbut. Tarbut in Hebrew means culture. And this uh, uh, high school or gymnasium uh, was one of the first uh, to develop a, a the knowledge and mastery of modern Hebrew. What happened in, uh, when World War II uh, broke out? You know that there was a, a kind of pact of non-aggression between uh, communist Soviet Union and the uh, Nazi Germany, the Ribbentrop-Molotov Agreement for non-aggression. And in 1941, June 1941, uh, when Hitler was sure that he was going to uh, have a, uh, he was going to uh, have a victory over the rest of Europe, he opened the Second Front against Russia, and uh, the German army invaded uh, the uh, Soviet Russian uh, territory. One of the first places where this invasion took place was Lithuania, and in. Uh, I don't remember exactly the date, but by, towards, I think, the end of June 1941, the uh, German um, uh, uh, tanks and army stormed Vilnius and occupied the town after a very short uh, battle. The Russian army uh, retreated and left Lithuania and left Vilnius. And shortly after the uh, conquest of uh, uh, Vilnius, the, the Germans sent a kind of a Einsatzgruppe, a, co a special commando, Einsatzgruppe 9, which means uh, commando, uh, commando unit number 9, to uh, uh, liquidate the Jewish population of uh, Vilnius. And this was the, one of the first places where the um, uh, genocide of European uh, Jew uh, Jewry be began. This uh, Einsatzgruppe 9, this uh, special commando group 9, uh, when they arrived to Vilnius, they uh, scouted a bit the uh, neighborhood of Vilnius to find a place where they could carry out the 
projected mass murder. And they found in a forest uh, some eight miles up the road from Vilnius, uh, a forest that was called the Ponar Forest. Um, they found, uh, ex not excavations, but uh, ditches that the Soviet army dug <laughs> in order to, uh, to store their ammunition for the artillery and for the tanks and so on. And they uh, thought that this was a very uh, useful uh, installation for uh, uh, mass graves. And they started to uh, hunt down Jews on the, on the streets of Vilnius uh, and to uh, transport them from the point of view of the Jews of Vilnius to an unknown destiny. No one knew where these Jews were taken. Uh, they simply disappeared. They were uh, uh, hunted down, put on uh, lorries, and taken, transported to an unknown destiny. The uh, Lithuanian uh, population, there, were, there was a Lithuanian uh, militia, a fascist Lithuanian militia called, called the Patinga militia. And they uh, co cooperated or collaborated with the Nazi occupying uh, forces in hunting down the Jews. They were very uh, uh, efficient in identifying Jews on the streets of uh, Vilnius. Um, the Jews called these guys Chapunes. Chapunes, uh, happen in Yiddish means to catch, to grab. And the Chapunes, the, this was the, the name they gave to those guys who were uh, hunting uh, uh, Jews on the streets of Vilnius. And this kind of uh, practice to, uh, lasted from June until September 41. And they, these Hapunes, with their very primitive tactic of catching people on the streets and loading them on lorries and transporting them uh, to an unknown destiny, reduced the population of the Jewish population of Vilnius from 75,000 to some 30,000, which means that 45,000 people approximately disappeared when no one knew where they were taken. There were all kinds of rumors. But of course, uh, the, the, the rest of the people, there was almost no family which was not uh, um, damaged by this uh, practice of uh, hunting down people and catching them uh, haphazardly on the streets of Vilnius. Um, the, the population was in a state of shock, the Jewish population. They didn't understand what was going on. One uh, uh, outstanding character, Jewish, uh, a Jewish intellectual, his name was Hermann Krupp, who was an activist of the Bund. And before the war, he uh, cooperated in uh, establishing some 350 centers, cultural centers throughout uh, Jewish, uh, Jewish, set, uh, Jewish uh, centers in Poland and in Lithuania. Hermann Krupp, uh, who was uh, who uh, found himself in Vilnius uh, when uh, the Nazis occupied the town, uh, decided to start to write a, a diary. And uh, he started to make entries into the diary from day to day, sometimes two, three times a day. And then in, uh, on the 6th, I think, of September 1941, the German uh, occupation forces authorities issued an, uh, an order to the Jewish population to leave their uh, homes, apartments, and so on, and go out on the street with whatever they want to take with them, and they will be directed to some, somewhere in the town. No one knew what it meant. Uh, what happened is that people went out from their homes and Crook in his diary notes it, that it took place at about 10 o'clock in the morning. It was a rainy day. People went out, where they took with them whatever they could carry, and very soon they found themselves herded through the streets of Vilnius, uh, uh, persecuted by these guys from the Ipatinga and, and some uh, German uh, soldiers towards some uh, a district of, uh, uh, at the center of Vilnius, and they found themselves um, pushed into uh, 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 that kind of quarter of Vilnius that comprised seven small uh, streets, rather alleyways. And this area before the war 
uh, held a population of some 3,000 people. Now imagine 30,000 people being pushed into those seven small streets and uh, having to find refuge or uh, asylum in the, in the apartments that were uh, emptied before uh, of the 3,000 inhabitants. The Germans took them also to Ponar. No one knew what happened there in Ponar, no one knew. Anyway, these 30,000 were pushed into, that, into those seven small streets. Uh, the, 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 this, uh, that region was enclosed, or this neighborhood was enclosed. They shut off the streets that led into these seven small streets. And thus, the, the Germans created the uh, ghetto of Vilnius, or the Vilna ghetto. And then uh, the people found themselves there in total disarray. They didn't know what was waiting for them, what was lying ahead for them. Uh, families found themselves uh, were uh, pushed together into rooms where uh, five or six families had to share the same room. Uh, the the, the uh, situation was unbelievably uh, the duress. They all were under terrible duress. And uh, shortly after the, after this, the the Germans uh, appointed a, a Judenrat which is the uh, Jewish uh, council, a council of the Jews, so to speak, where they, uh, they appointed a few people to run it, and they gave them some um, um, powers. And the, this Jewish council had now to, uh, to uh, control and to run the, and to arrange and to organize the life of these uh, 30,000 people who lived, who were pushed into that ghetto. Now, the Germans uh, continued to, uh, um, se to carry out selections among these 30,000 people. And shortly after, I mean, between September and December 41, they reduced the number of the inhabitants of the ghetto from 30,000 to 15,000. 15, and then, all of a sudden, they stopped um, hunting people and carrying them out of the ghetto. And these 15,000 uh, constituted now a, a kind of stable population of the Vilna, uh, of the Vilna ghetto. Uh, a very interesting character, his name was Jacob Gens, who was uh, an officer in the, a Jew, was an officer in the Lithuanian army in the 1920s. And later he was uh, a director, a manager of a prison in Vilnius. And he was um, married to a non-Jewish woman, a, a Lithuanian woman. He had a daughter um, who was at, at that time 16, 17 years old. He lived outside the ghetto. And he had many friends among uh, the high-ranking uh, uh, Lithuanian uh, military from before the war. He could easily uh, continue his life outside the ghetto, and no one would have bothered him. But he decided to enter the ghetto to volunteer to uh, help the uh, Jewish council in the ghetto, the Judenrat, to run the ghetto. Because he said, I have uh, military experience, I have very good connections with the um, uh, Lithuanian uh, uh, officers, uh, I have many friends, high-ranking friends in the Lithuanian society. Uh, he knew German, he spoke German, he spoke Russian, he spoke Lithuanian, and of course Yiddish. So he said, I can help the um, Jewish population in the ghetto. I can help to uh, normalize their life in the ghetto. He became head of the police, of the Jewish police of the ghetto. And um, Jacob Gens, he was then 42 or 43 years old, uh, he, he, he tried to understand what was the logic behind the uh, extermination of the Jews of Vilnius? Because at that time, the Germans still did not uh, uh, implement the policy of uh, the uh, uh, final solution. You know that the decision about the final solution took place in January 1942 at the Wannsee Conference in Berlin. And until then, there was no uh, official policy of the extermination of Jews, of the European Jews. So in Vilnius, the, uh, the uh, genocide against the Jews of Vilnius began prior 
to the um, uh, decision that taken in the, at the Vanze conference. And the reason behind it, I don't know exactly what it was. No one really knows exactly what it was, but uh, historians, they surmise that the, the project of the Germans was to, uh, uh, to clean, so to speak, to do an ethnic cleansing of, of, of Lithuania from uh, the Jewish population in order to uh, uh, settle their uh, German uh, settlers in uh, parts of Lithuania. This was probably one of, of their projects. And this is probably the reason why this, they began with the extermination of the Lithuanian Jews before uh, uh, implementing that policy uh, in, the, uh, the rest, in the rest of uh, Lithuania and Poland. Anyway, Gens said that probably because now the Germans are involved in a war on two fronts, on the Western Front on one side and on the Eastern Front against uh, Soviet Russia, they will need every, uh, uh, every human, every manpower that could help them with the war effort. And it, it, that, therefore, he, he thought that uh, if the Jewish population of the Vilna ghetto will prove to be a, a, a productive element, the Germans will need them, and they will stop carrying out further uh, mass murders uh, uh, among that uh, population of the Jews of Vilnius. So he, uh, he um, formulated a kind of policy saying we have to make of the Vilna, Vilnius ghetto a productive ghetto, and then we'll be an asset for the German war effort, and they will need us, and we will survive. And in order to make the ghetto productive, he thought that life must be normalized. What does it mean to normalize life? It means to give people a feeling that now the situation has stabilized, and uh, we are now, there was a, a terrible catastrophe. The population was reduced from 75,000 to 15,000. At that point, also, rumors began to reach the ghetto that the, the people who were missing, who were taken out and transported out of the ghetto, it was the first time that there were rumors that they were murdered in Ponar. Until then, there was no information about what was going on in Ponar. And only when a, a young girl and a woman who managed to survive the, uh, the, 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 the killing in the ditches by uh, firing squads, managed to reach the ghetto. Uh, a wounded girl and a wounded woman came back, and they told what was going on in Ponar. Then, at first, the people in the ghetto who heard it, they didn't believe it. They thought that these women were probably hallucinating, that it was not possible, it was not true, it was impossible that the Germans would carry out a mass murder of thousands, tens of thousands of people there in ditches in the forest of Ponar. But slowly, the uh, awareness of what was going on settled down, and then uh, these 15,000 people who lived in the ghetto, um, under the control of the uh, Jewish council, they uh, accepted Gens's policy that uh, uh, if life will be normalized and the ghetto will become productive, the ghetto will survive. And so, among other things, Gens uh, encouraged the opening of, a, of a, a schooling system in the ghetto for uh, children, for orphans, because many children lost their parents during those uh, wild uh, hunting down of people on the streets of Vilnius. He opened, uh, he encouraged, or he collected and brought together a few doctors and uh, nurses that survived the killings and started a, a hospital in the ghetto. And uh, then he had the idea to open a theater in the ghetto. And he said in order to normalize life, one of the uh, elements that the people need is something that will boost up the morale, that will help them, that will help the people 
restore the feeling that they have human values and human, uh, that their culture uh, uh, is uh, still alive and they can uh, find a, a kind of solidarity with themselves by um, sticking to their culture. And it meant to, uh, to start a theater in the ghetto. Um, it all, I discovered all this when I read the footnote in the book of the, that partisan who said the uh, resistance movement was opposed to the uh, uh, founding of the theater in the ghetto. So I started to look around me in Israel at the time, it was in the uh, beginning of the 80s, to find more material about that theater. And then one survivor of the ghetto of Vilnius said to me, um, if you are interested in the story of the theater, you should talk to uh, Israel Segal. And I said, who is Israel Segal? So this woman said to me, well, he was the artistic director of the theater. And I said, is he alive? And she said, as, as far as I know, he, he must be alive. I don't know where he is, but he must be alive. I know that he survived. So what did I do at the time? There was no internet and no Googling. <laughs> I took the Israeli telephone directory and looked up and found Israel Segal, a uh, stage director. So I said, this must be the man. And I saw his address. It was Golden Street in Tel Aviv. We lived on Merchant Street, which is like 10 minutes walk from Golden Street. I called, I rang him up, and the man answers me. And I said, I, are you Israel Segal, the artistic <laughs> director of the ghetto theater? He says, yes. Uh, and I say, well, uh, I'm Joshua Sobol, I want, I'm interested in the theater in the ghetto. And he says to me, why are you interested in that theater? And I said, because I'm uh, amazed at the fact that there was a theater functioning under these terrible conditions there. Uh, can I meet you? And he hesitated. And then he said, uh, yeah, OK, if you want, yeah, please come over and uh, I will uh, receive you. So I went to his place. And I found a 72-year-old man who suffered of Parkinson at that time. He was, uh, uh, he was quite limited in movement. He, sa he was sitting in a uh, wheelchair. And we started talking. And I asked him questions. He answered me and so on. And at that time, I forgot to say that uh, one of the... Uh, um, uh, uh, one of the suggestions that I got from, from a survivor from the Vilna Ghetto who said to me, uh, have you read Crook's diary, Herman Crook's diary? I said, no, I don't know about this diary. What is that? And the man said to me, you must find Crook's diary. Uh, he wrote everything about what, was, what took place in the ghetto. So I started to look around, and the diary was not published in Israel. I found out that it was published by the Ivo Institute, which is the Yiddish uh, Wissenschaft, uh, Wissenschaftlicher Institute, uh, the Yiddish uh, uh, cultural institution that functioned in, in that is situated in New York. Um, I wrote a letter to them and asked for uh, Crook's diary, and they sent me the diary, which is a 700-page book in Yiddish. Fortunately enough, I, uh, I know Yiddish, I read Yiddish, I, can, I write in Yiddish. So I, I started to, to read the diary, and it was a mind-blowing experience, because Crook, uh, as I said before, Herman Crook, who ran the library of the ghetto, by the way, he uh, established the diary by collecting books that People throw out on the street on the day when the when the ghetto was founded, and they, they, they ran out of their or they pushed out or kicked out of their places, running in, on this to the streets of Vilnius, and they, some of them took with them books and so on. And then on the way, they couldn't carry all this, and they left it behind them and threw up, uh, away the books and threw away other uh, 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 things. Herman Crook ran there with a wheelbarrow and collected books on the streets of Vilnius, brought them into the ghetto. He got hold of a place there and opened the library. A few days after the establishment of the Vilna ghetto, he already read <coughs> a library in the ghetto. And uh, he, as I said, he started to put, to make entries into his diary. 
by the way, which he dictated to a um, secretary of his, uh, uh, who typed it in four uh, copies on a typewriter. And um, what happened, I'm jumping in time. When the ghetto was liberated after, in 1944, when the Russian army uh, 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 liberated Vilnius or uh, reoccupied it, or kicked out the Germans, the Jewish partisans who worked in Crook's library before they left the ghetto and went to the forest to join the partisans there. Among them, there were two poets. Uh, one was Shmerke Kaczerginski, and the, the other poet was um, uh, Sutzkever, Abraham Sutzkever. The first thing they did when they got back to uh, uh, liberated Vilnius, they ran to the site of the library, which was bombed out, and they started to look for Crook's diary, for the pages of Crook's diary. They fumbled in the debris, and they ma managed to recover some 750 typewritten pages, which were, uh, some of them were uh, unintelligible, but others were in good condition. And they managed to reestablish the, uh, the diary. And as I said, they uh, sent it over to the Ivo Institute in New York uh, that published the diary. So when I read the diary, I found out that Crook uh, um, recorded every event that took place in the ghetto in real time. And he, he recorded every uh, important or unimportant or uh, anything that took place in the ghetto without censoring himself. And that when I say uh, not censoring himself, he did not hesitate to write down that uh, a new brothel was opened in the ghetto and that some women are working there. He did not hesitate to note that a certain uh, young woman who was a pharmacist had a relationship with a German officer, and so on and so forth. So all the details of, of, of uh, uh, without any censorship, his diary is, uh, I would say, the, uh, 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 an example of uh, the best journalism one can imagine. And <clears throat> so Crook, I found out that he was the, uh, <laughs> the initiator of that, or the, the first one who uh, launched the, uh, the, uh, no, the Maxim in a courtyard. You shouldn't play, you shouldn't play theater in a courtyard. In a, in a graveyard, sorry, in a graveyard, not the courtyard. In a graveyard, uh, in a cemetery. Yeah, it shouldn't play uh, theater in a cemetery. So he was the first one to launch it. He was opposed to the establishment of the theater. Yet, he was honest enough to, uh, to attend the first uh, performance in the theater ghetto. And as I say, honest enough to write a review of what was taking place there and saying, uh, well, the performance was on a high cultural level. It is not, uh, it did not, it is not an injury or not a, no, uh, to the, it doesn't, mm, it is not an offense to the memory of the, of the tragic events that took place in Vilnius. That is what he, what he writes in his diary. And then he started to follow and to comment on the activities of the theater, among other things, among everything else that took place in the ghetto. So I, when I met uh, Israel Segal, I was already, uh, after having read uh, Crook's diary, backwards and forwards from uh, cover to cover a few times. And uh, when I met Israel Segal, and we talked about what took place there, uh, he told me certain things, and he said, uh, for instance, that a German officer, Kittel, came to see a certain performance. And I said to him, but it's impossible. At that point, Kittel was not yet in the ghetto. And he says to me, how come? What you are telling me? I was in the ghetto. And I said, but Crook, in his diary, mentions that Kittel came to the ghetto later. He says, this is impossible. And I said, yes, it is. Uh, well, I, I tell you. And then happened something <laughs> which I couldn't imagine even. Uh, this man who was uh, wheelchair-ridden jumped out of his wheelchair, ran to his uh, bookshelf, 
climb up a ladder. I was running after him because I, I was afraid that he was going to break his neck. And uh, he picked out a, a Crook's diary from his library, ran back to his wheelchair, uh, collapsed in the wheelchair, opened the, 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 the diary, and we looked up. And he said, yeah, you're right. <laughs> you're right. But how come? I, don't, I remember it differently. And I said, but look, Crook writes the dates and even sometimes the hours of uh, the, the day when, when things took place. And it was when I realized that uh, how, how, I mean, what is a recorded memory and what is live memory. And that live memory is something so different from recorded memory that sometimes you have to compare the two in order to understand what happens to people who are rearranging uh, their memory and are re restarting and re, um, I mean, telling their stories about things and then taking their own stories for uh, real, uh, for, I mean, believing the, the chronology which they invent sometimes. Anyway, um, at a certain point, I remember that uh, um, one evening, uh, uh, Israel Segal calls me, and he says to me, are you free? And I said, yes, what's the matter? And he says, the souffleur of the theater, you know what's the souffleur, yeah? Uh, of, of the theater uh, uh, is at my place. If you want to come, uh, he has probably uh, things that he can tell you. And, uh, you know, the, I, I think nowadays this job of a souffleur doesn't exist anymore in the theaters, but uh, at the time, in the European, at least the European theater, the souffleur in the theater, he had a special cabin uh, uh, downstage, and uh, he knew by heart uh, all the texts of the, of the plays, he would follow it, and uh, when uh, an actor had a blackout, the souffleur would uh, uh, prompt him and... Yeah, there's the famous joke about the uh, Hamlet, I think, and uh, Laertes, or is it there? No. Uh, at a certain point in the play, who don't know what to do, and the souffleur does to them this. Yeah, meaning you have to... So <laughs> they knew many things, that they remembered things that uh, the actors sometimes forget. And uh, I met a man called, his name was Pergament, Mr. Pergament. And I start to talk to him, and he tells me stories about things that uh, Israel Segal did not remember anymore, about the uh, performances that took place in the ghetto, and about a special number that they did at, in a, in their small, on their small stage, because they, the, the theater was so successful that they opened a, 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 a main stage and a small stage. And uh, on that small stage, they performed satirical programs that were written and the songs were, the lyrics were written in the ghetto, the music was composed in the ghetto. And one of the things that amazed me was uh, the kind of songs and music that they uh, composed in the ghetto because the, uh, against any expectations or uh, prejudices, what I discovered was that the, they, they wrote tangos, they wrote waltzes, they wrote foxtrot uh, songs to the tune of foxtrot and other dances that were at the time, even flamenco. And uh, so, um, uh, yeah, Mr. Pergament, that uh, souffleur of the theater, tells me about a, a number that they, uh, uh, that they uh, wrote and acted, uh, played in the, on the small stage, which had to do with uh, with empty uh, costumes that were hung uh, to dry out uh, after they have been laundered, and the costumes start to uh, start a controversy. Who is more important? There is a costume of a judge, and a costume of a rabbi, and a costume of a doctor, and a costume of a worker, <laughs> and it was a bitter satire. The people were not there anymore, but the empty costumes still believed that they uh, retained the value of what was the person who wore that costume before. And the costumes uh, are uh, self-inflated with importance and uh, with the uh, uh, feeling that they are still very, very uh, important. So 
uh, he told me about that number that was uh, play, acted out, uh, written and acted out on the small stage. Anyway, uh, I felt that my head was full with those stories of uh, what took place there on the stage of the Vilna Ghetto. And uh, I didn't know what to do with all that stuff. I must say that uh, I, uh, I didn't even think that I was going to write a play about it, because it was impossible. The, um, the, the, the uh, um, dimensions of, of, of that stuff, the variety of characters, the variety of events, the, uh, the, 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 all these unbelievable stories that took place. Um, like, to give you one example, uh, a story about uh, women who were taken to Ponar to be executed. And it was a, uh, a freezing cold day, winter day, and they were told to strip naked and to stand uh, on, the, uh, on the verge of the ditch. And they were standing there, and there was a, a squad, a firing squad of uh, Lithuanian militiamen uh, who were drunk uh, because they used to drink a lot. And they started to talk and to tell uh, jokes to one another, and they forgot themselves. And there was a Nazi officer there, Kittel. And one of the women who was standing there among the other women she, she uh, called Kittel and she said, uh, Mr. Kittel, you, if you are not going to shoot us pretty soon, we will die, uh, we will freeze to death. Yeah. So he called her and he said, are you cold? And she said, yes, I'm freezing cold. He said, so dress up. And she dressed up and he, sa he said, go back to the ghetto. And he gave an order to the squad to shoot the others and they fired and killed the other women. I read that story for, and this is one story. And then there, is, there are more stories of that kind, which uh, gave me a, a, a notion of what, was, what happens to people when they are given to soldiers, to military uh, men, when they are given a force of life and death over a population, a helpless population. Now, this guy, Kittel, was a, a lieutenant. He was only a, a lieutenant, a young lieutenant. He was uh, 22 years old, a kid, in, uh, if we think of uh, today's youth. He was given a full power of these 15, 000, over these 15,000 people in the ghetto. And he could do whatever he wished. He could kill people. He could uh, um, uh, give them full grace, etc. Um, so. I didn't know how to handle that stuff, which was accumulated, I would say so, in my mind, in my imagination, in my, uh, yeah. And I was at that time uh, teaching at the Tel Aviv University. I was sitting one day with my students, and uh, they asked me, it was a, a class of writing drama, and one of the students asked me, what are you writing nowadays? What are you writing now? And they said, I'm not writing anything. And he said, it's impossible, you always write something, yeah? And I said, no, at that moment I'm not writing anything, I'm reading and I collect, I'm collecting, uh, I'm researching and collecting material about a theater that functioned in the Vilna Ghetto. And uh, the students said, what, 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 what are you talking about? What theater, what is it? And I started to tell them uh, the story of the theater. And at uh, the end of like two hours, of the lesson, so to speak, I realized that I, I had the whole play uh, somehow um, structured in my mind without my knowing it even, without my being aware of it. So I uh, rushed back home, and I was very lucky because it was Passover uh, vacation. So I had like two weeks free and I uh, rushed to my typewriter. At the time, uh, we used typewriters, these uh, <laughs> prehistoric uh, uh, <laughs> tools. And I uh, simply had to run after the words, I mean, rush after the words, after the scenes, after the characters, and so on and so forth. And uh, before I, was, I knew what I was doing, the play was there. 
Uh, it all happened, so to speak, when I was talking to my students, and, uh, uh, and the play dictated itself, so to speak. And um, uh, I didn't think that I was going to write any other play. Uh, but then what happened is that I um, uh, sent the play to uh, one of the survivors of the Gita Vilna Ghetto, uh, who was the command, uh, second in command of the uh, underground movement, the poet Abba Kovner, who is a famous personality, uh, the late Abba Kovner. And he uh, uh, sent me a long letter saying that, yeah, the play was uh, uh, well, well contrived, well written, et cetera, et cetera, but that the underground movement, the partisan movement, didn't get enough space in the play. So I answered him, uh, the underground movement uh, requires and deserves a special drama in itself. And he, he answered me, Yes, I know these uh, uh, pretexts that uh, writers say we will write a special story about this, and it never happens anymore. But the truth was that I, I was already involved in researching the story of the underground movement um, uh, because what happened in the Vilnius ghetto, among other things, was uh, the fact that at a certain point, uh, Kithel, that Nazi officer whom I mentioned before, uh, man managed uh, to arrest two communists outside the ghetto, uh, Christian communists, and the Gestapo uh, interrogated them, and they uh, gave out the name of a Jewish communist who lived in the ghetto. His name was Itzik Wittenberg, and they uh, admitted that they had a connection with him, and that they furnished him with uh, arms in, in exchange of uh, him uh, taking care to publish uh, to print uh, a paper for them, papers for the, for the communists outside the ghetto. That he, he was a communist inside, a Jewish communist inside the ghetto. So Kittel came to Gans and uh, demanded him to hand him over uh, that Itzik Wittenberg. Now Itzik Wittenberg happened to be the head of the, uh, of the uh, partisan movement in the ghetto. And uh, there is no antecedent to the fact that a, a partisan movement or a re re resistance movement would hand over its uh, commander to the, hands, to the hands of the enemy. But what Kittel did, he, he uh, gave out an ultimatum. He said, either I get Itzig Wittenberg or the entire ghetto will be liquidated. I'm cutting a long story short uh, because it's a very, very um, a complex story. What happened is that at a certain point, the uh, headquarters of the underground movement in the ghetto um, met together in a kind of in a carpentry in the ghetto, together with Isaac Wittenberg, and they had to decide what to do, uh, either to uh, to accept the ultimatum and hand over uh, Wittenberg, or to take the risk that the Germans will. Uh, um, wipe out the entire ghetto. What happened is that the Gens um, uh, um, summoned the heads of uh, workers group in the ghetto and said to them, listen, people, uh, the entire ghetto will be uh, 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 exterminated because of a communist uh, who was uh, given over, whose name was given over to the, Ger to the Gestapo by uh, communist comrades outside the ghetto. Now, if you can influence your sons, your daughters, to uh, uh, make up their mind and to give over uh, Itzik Wittenberg to the Germans, you will save the ghetto. I cannot do anything anymore. So the population of the ghetto during that night besieged that carpentry, I mean the population, thousands probably of people, besieged the uh, carpentry where the commanders of the underground assembled. And, that, and they were shouting and screaming and saying, give out Wittenberg, give out Wittenberg. Now, uh, there were uh, youngsters of the underground movement who uh, pulled out their arms because they had pistols, they had submachine guns. 
Uh, they stood there confronting their parents, confronting the population of the ghetto, saying, uh, I mean, saying them, you don't dare try to storm the carpentry because we'll open fire on you. And uh, they faced a terrible dilemma, that the first shots in the ghetto would be fired by uh, members of the underground movement at the population of the ghetto, at their parents, at their sisters, brothers, etc. <coughs> at a certain point, uh, the commanders of the underground understood that the pressure was terrible, and they told one of the young uh, girls who belonged to the underground, uh, her name was Jenia Berkon, to take Wittenberg disguised as an old woman and to uh, hide him in her mother's cabin in the ghetto. And she, according to the documents, she, she took him and she hid him there, and they made the decision. And the decision was that uh, Wittenberg had to uh, give himself over to the Germans. Now, uh, I did not under, and then uh, in all the documents that I read, and in the, written, the testimony that I managed to get from Abba Kovna and from other people, I found out that there were like two hours during that night when the, during which the uh, members of the headquarters of the underground lost contact with Wittenberg. And I didn't understand what, what it meant. What does it mean that they lost contact with Wittenberg for two hours during that night? It took me another two or three years to research and to find a document Again, uh, in the papers of the Ivo Institute, the testimony of, of that young girl, Jenia Berkon, who said that she was uh, entrusted with the job to hide it, Wittenberg in her mother's cabin in the ghetto, and that at a certain point, a messenger from the headquarters of the underground came to her and said, we decided that Wittenberg should uh, uh, give himself over to the Gestapo, please, give us Wittenberg. And she said to him, according to her testimony, I received him from the headquarters of the underground. I don't believe you. I don't know who you are. Let them all come, and then I will, if they tell me to give him over, I will give him over. So the guy said to her, OK, I understand you, and he went away. And she says that she opened the door of the cabin, and Wittenberg was standing behind the door. He was pale as a page, as a white page of paper. That's how she describes him. <coughs> he, he, and she said to him, come with me. And he followed her. And she took him up the stairs to, the, to an attic. And she said, run away. And he tried to, to escape, to run away through the, uh, the uh, 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 a network of attics that were un uh, interconnected there. And his friends came to, I mean, the members of the underground arrived there. The whole ghetto, as I said before, was seven small streets. So it took them like five minutes, maybe, to get there. And to ask her, where is Wittenberg? She said, I don't know. He disappeared. I, I went away for a moment. He probably opened the door and ran away. So they started to run and call him. Itzik, 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 itzik. And what happened is that the Jewish police, who was also trying to uh, hunt him down, a policeman who was on, uh, on the roofs of the, of the buildings of the ghetto came face to face with him, wanted to arrest him. Wittenberg pulled out his gun and shot over the head of the policeman. He didn't uh, kill the policeman. But his friends heard the shot, and they understood that it was him. They called him. He came down. And he hand handed over his handgun to uh, Abakovna and said, now you are the commander of the underground. And he went to Gens. He said to them, according to the uh, testimony of uh, Genia Berkon, he said, your decision is totally wrong. The Germans will first of all kill me, then they will liquidate you, the underground, and then they will liquidate the ghetto without any resistance. This is their tactics. He was not right. Uh, he went to Gens. He had uh, an exchange with Gens. No one knows exactly what was said and done there. Then, he left Gens and he went out and he gave, gave himself over to the Gestapo. And the same night, he died. Uh, he committed suicide uh, by uh, poison. And I, I asked Abba Kovner, 
did you give him the poison? Did the underground uh, people give him the poison? They said, no, we didn't give him the poison. We think that Gens gave him the poison. And I said, but the Germans should have made a, should have served him up. And he said, no, we had a tactic. And it was to rub the, uh, the Tian Kali under, uh, under the nails, so that if you want to commit suicide, you had to suck your nails, and that would be enough in order to kill you, if you had uh, enough of this Tian Kali. Anyway, uh, the fact is that the Germans did not uh, liquidate the ghetto after they finished him. I mean, after he committed suicide, they returned him to the ghetto, and they didn't try to arrest the other uh, leaders of the underground. So uh, I wrecked my brain, what was their policy? And I understood one thing, that at that point already, it was 43, it was uh, a few months after the debacle of uh, Stalingrad, where the, the Germans lost you know, the Battle of Stalingrad, and uh, it was the beginning of the end of the Second World War. The, uh, the, the, the Gestapo and the German uh, authorities in the ghettos were interested to, to um, uh, maintain the existence of the ghettos because so long as they were there, they were not sent over to the Russian front. And being uh, sent to the Russian front meant for them death or uh, <laughs> uh, prison or whatever. Anyway, they preferred to control the Jews in the ghettos, so they were not interested to make fuss about the fact that there was a, an underground movement functioning in the, in the Vilna ghetto. Yeah, so this would made me to write, write the other play, Adam, about uh, the uh, underground movement and the tragedy of uh, the underground movement who had to face a, 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 an impossible choice, uh, either to hand over their commander or to uh, accept the liquidation of the entire ghetto. And at a, uh, to a certain extent, this was uh, the um, dilemma that Gens faced on a daily uh, basis in the ghetto, having to decide whom he would hand over, whom he would save, and uh, so on and so forth. I will just mention one thing, that at a certain point, Gens tells the story that uh, the German officer came to him and said, we want uh, uh, some 400 children uh, for, to, to send over to Ponar. And Gens said to him, why kill children? You have uh, started a Reich, uh, yeah, a kingdom that will last for a thousand years, according to what you say. These children will grow up, grow up, and they will be a very, uh, well, a very useful uh, human manpower for you. You can take old people, why take the children? And the German officer answers him, and this is what Gens writes in his uh, uh, records. He said, you know, there is a difference of value between the life of a, an elderly person and a child. And Gens says, okay, this difference can be calculated in money. And the German officer says to him, you said it. So he says, okay, and he pulls out a, uh, a wad of bills and offers it to the German officer, and the German officer sticks it in his pocket and says, okay, uh, but you know, the life of an old man is, is, is less, uh, uh, the, world, the worth of the life of an old man is less than the life of a child, so give me, 800 instead of 400 children. And Gens starts to bargain with him and he says, uh, but if we find out that we, uh, we don't have 800 uh, uh, non-productive people in the, in the ghetto. And he says, well, productive, you know, is a r relative uh, uh, notion and so on. And he was bargaining and, and he says in that uh, document, Gens says, this was my policy. They came and they asked for a certain number of people. I, at the first, uh, my first answer was, all right. Then I would say, uh, take uh, sick and elderly people and not the healthy and young. Then when they agreed, I would uh, bargain about the number. And when we agreed about the number, I would give them finally 
uh, less than the agreed number, and they would accept it, and the rest would be paid and so forth. So all this material, all this stuff became for me what I would call <coughs> impossible theater. Impossible theater. Because uh, I did not know any theater, any example of drama that dealt with that kind of impossible uh, human um, uh, conditions and, uh, and impossible moral decisions which were which didn't offer any moral issue. And Gens was the one who recognized it by saying, I know that, what I, that my decisions cannot be defended on an ethical uh, level. Uh, what I'm doing is uh, not, is immoral, but he said they are waging against us a biological war. They, uh, they want to exterminate us as a, a biological species. And the only way we have to react is like a biological species would react to a project of its annihilation. And what would, a, what would such a species do? It would try to ensure its progenity. Uh, so it means saving the young, the fertile, and offer the sick, the old, those who, cannot, uh, who have no longer any... Uh, effect on the continua continuation of the, of, the, of the species. And he said, it's like we wait, they kill us like rats, and we must react to them like rats. We have to behave like rats who try to save themselves, and this is it. So you see, this is what made me write those plays, the ghetto, Adam, and then the third play, Underground, of, of, of which I will not speak now, because then we will continue and we'll go on, I don't know until when. <laughs> Uh, and uh, what it made me understand one thing. It made me understand how important theater could be in a situation where a, a human community is um, put under, uh, is, is, uh, is uh, threatened with its extermination, which is the uh, most extreme phase of, of um, oppression. And uh, uh, what I found out, talking to people who survived the, uh, the Vilna Ghetto, was how important theater was for them under those conditions. And the theater dealt with those problems which I mentioned throughout my short presentation here. For instance, there was a problem in the theater, in the theater, in the ghetto, that the um, um, pharmacy of the hospital was running out of uh, its stock of insulin. And they had diabetics in the ghetto. They were diabetics. And the young doctor who was responsible for the uh, pharmacy of the uh, hospital, he didn't know what to do anymore. He, he assembled the rabbi of the ghetto, a judge, an uh, elderly doctor, and he asked them uh, to, uh, to uh, advise him what to do. And he said, if we cut the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, handing out insulin to the, uh, to the uh, very sick people, to the extreme cases of diabetes, diabetics, we can uh, spare enough insulin to ensure the survival of the younger and the, the less affected patients for another year or two. If we continue to deal out the insulin as we are doing now, it will, uh, we will run out of insulin within two months or so, and all the uh, patients will start to die, one after the other. What shall I do? And what, what uh, he says in a document uh, that was published in a, in a, uh, uh, by a certain institute in Israel, he, he says that the, doc, the, the, the rabbi and the old doctor and the judge just copped out. They said every one of them had these uh, reasons why not to deal with the question, and they left him to decide for himself. And the, the theater in the ghetto played the story of the insulin. So I it, it integrated that story into, I mean, that dilemma and that drama into my play, Ghetto. And then one day, <laughs> After the play was published, 
the text of the was published in Israel, I received a letter from Sydney, Australia, and uh, the letter uh, on the envelope, I see the name of uh, the doctor who wrote the document and whom I, I brought as a character in my play. And I open it, uh, and I, he writes to me, imagine, imagine my astonishment, my surprise, when I got your play, by, sent to me by friends who live in Israel, and I discovered that I figure in your drama. And I answered him. And then uh, one day he came over to Israel, and uh, we met in, my, in our place. And I asked him, tell me, what have you done? What was your decision? Because in the document which he published, he doesn't say what he decided about the insulin. So I had to imagine what, what he decided in my play. He decides to carry out a selection between the, among the, the uh, diabetics. And I asked him, what have you decided, Weinrib? His name was Weinrib, Dr. Weinrib. And he thought for a moment, and then he said, look, I understood at that point that there are situations in life where uh, pleasing everybody is not the most important thing. This was his answer. So I said, I understand that you carried out a selection. He said, you said it. <laughs> you said it. He did not want to admit it. And uh, uh, you see, and this was in, in 1987, or I don't remember exactly the date, so many years after the event. So my third play, uh, Underground deals with the story of the underground the department of the hospital in the ghetto, uh, which is based on uh, my encounter with uh, Dr. Weinrib and the stories that he told me about that underground department, which uh, Gens ordered him to open. He was a young doctor, then he was 28 years old, and Gens ordered him to open a typhus uh, department because in a, in a, neighbor, uh, in a neighboring ghetto, the Germans discovered that there, were, there was a typhus epidemic and there were typhus patients hospitalized in the hospital, and they surrounded the hospital, they put it on fire together with the sick and the, and the staff and everybody, and they didn't want to, to have to deal with epidemics, especially so when these epidemics came from Jews who were anyway uh, uh, destined to be uh, uh, liquidated. So Gens ordered him to open, uh, this Dr. Weinrib, to open a uh, typhus uh, uh, department in the hospital of the ghetto. And Weinrib uh, um, engaged a, 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 young do a young woman doctor who helped him. And they found that the uh, typhus uh, department, where they uh, hospitalized the sick people affected with typhus, but on the on the chart they gave them false uh, diagnosis it, for the case that a, a German inspection will come to that uh, the, uh, department in the ghetto and check out what what was going on there, and they had twice visits of uh, SS of, uh, doctors, and they managed to fool them with this false diagnosis. So um, this is what I mean. That story of that hospital made me write the third part, uh, the, the, the play called Underground. And I know that I, uh, for me, the experience of these three plays, I, I call it the impossible theater. It is a kind of impossible theater, dealing with impossible situations dealing with impossible forms of drama, which must be a, what I found out. I did not uh, intend it. It must be a kind of mixture of, all, of, of tragedy and farce and comedy and grotesque situations and song and dance. And uh, uh, anyway, I would say almost a, a kind of med form of theater, crazy form of theater. And uh, the best performances of uh, Ghetto, for instance, had that quality of, mm, of crazy theater, of mad theater, where 
these impossible situations were acted out, and uh, one of the, uh, the, well, the play opened in Haifa and in Berlin at the same time, and the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the German director who did the German premiere of the play, he was a, a German Jew, his name was Peter Zadek. He was a great director, and he brought to the stage a really crazy form <laughs> of the play. Um, and this is what made the play, I would say, uh, well known. Uh, it launched the play uh, throughout, uh, I mean, uh, the world, so to speak. And uh, uh, anyway, uh, I don't know if I managed to uh, give you an, a feeling or a notion of what it means for me, impossible drama, drama that has to do with uh, fighting against oppression trying to break through that oppression and to create a form of theater that is, I would say, for me, in my mind, a liberating form of theater. That if it is duly and well performed, it brings a lot of freedom to the stage and to the audience who watch, who watch it. And this doesn't go without conflicts, without controversies and so on and so forth. But let us leave it for the question and answer session. If you have any questions after this uh, exhausting uh, speech of mine, <laughs> so please, uh, Guy, if you want to. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Guy Benaon, and uh, I run Israeli Stage, which is the company that's hosting Joshua now for uh, a residency that uh, you are the first uh, engagement of uh, a series of engagements. And we'd love to open this up and hear if you have any questions for Joshua um, about uh, the topic in which he spoke or any other questions that might be opening up uh, for you all. And I'll, I'll hand this microphone around so that we can hear everybody. The, the, the partisan group that was against the theater in the, um, in the ghetto, which they saw as something you don't do in, in a graveyard, what, what did they want to happen instead? I mean, did they expect the people who were there simply to roll over and die, or did they have some theory of, of what that community should be like? Yeah, uh, well, uh, they, they believed that the theater was, in a way, uh, helping people to uh, avoid the uh, taking position and, I, I mean, uh, committing themselves to an open struggle against the German occupation. Now, we have to understand that the, the uh, partisan movement consisted of very young people. They were uh, me members of the youth movements in the ghetto, of the various youth movements. They were mostly, uh, they were younger, I mean, they were, in their, uh, they were 18, 19, 20 years old people. Uh, they did not accept members, I mean, new members who, who couldn't bring with them a weapon. The condition to join the underground movement was if you want to join the, uh, the movement, you have to bring with you a weapon to get a pistol or a or some machine gun or a hand grenade or whatever. So, of course, it, it, in itself, it became a very selective society. I mean, the underground movement. And uh, they believed that uh, the ghetto should, uh, at a certain point, uh, um, open a, a, an open uh, struggle, uh, a, 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 um, armed struggle against the German uh, authority, uh, occupation authorities. Uh, Gens, he was not against the, uh, the underground movement, which is very interesting. He had a, he maintained a permanent contact with the members of the underground movement, with the commanders. Uh, he told them that if the situation comes to uh, uh, liquidation of the ghetto, on that day he will uh, call for a, for a, um, 
uh, a general revolt against the Germans. He said the Jewish police will join, we will use our arms, and we will uh, create a kind of common front. But as long as the Germans are not trying to liquidate the entire ghetto, I, I don't want to start a, re a revolt because this will uh, uh, precipitate the end of the ghetto. So uh, this was the controversy between Gens and the underground. But as a matter of fact, the underground at a certain point started to carry out also cultural activities in the youth club, club the Jugendklub in the ghetto. And uh, they even put, uh, members of the underground even they put on a show of uh, David Pinsky's uh, The Eternal Jew. Yeah, uh, so in Hebrew, not in Yiddish. Uh, so uh, the, the, by the force of things, they finally they uh, ended up, I would say, by accepting the uh, activity of the theater in the ghetto. And by the way, when uh, the theater had its 100th performance, they celebrated it. I found the documents in the Evo Institute in New York, in the archives of the Evo Institute, and they celebrated the sale of the 35,000th uh, ticket to the theater. Now, the theater uh, <laughs> seated 300 people, and I found out that the average was 350 uh, spectators per performance, which means they were always overbooked which means the population uh, ran to the theater, and they needed the theater, probably. And this is what people also told me, the survivors. They said, uh, a, a woman who was 17 years old at the ghetto, she said, we used, after uh, coming back from the forced labor day, uh, we used to put our best clothes and go to the theater and meet our friends there, uh, watch the show, and share a cup of tea after it. And she said, it gave us a feeling that we are human beings and not just beasts or animals. Yeah. Yeah. So earlier today, when you were talking about your staging of Merchant of Venice, I was really fascinated by uh, that discussion. And I, as I was listening to your um, telling of uh, the story of Ghetto, I just wondered how you would feel about a director taking that out of its historical context and maybe imagining a dystopian futuristic setting or even you know, thinking about communities that might be in extreme oppressive situations right now. You mean uh, if someone took my play? Yep. Yeah, it happened and already. <laughs> took the play and there put were, it in a completely so different context? There were many productions, you know, there were many, many productions of yeah. the play. Uh, I, I saw only a very limited number of them. Mm -hmm. But it ha I know that in uh, Holland there was a production where they um, decided to, uh, to cast only women in all the parts of the play, mm -hmm. yeah, including the Nazi officer, the head of the ghetto, and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, well, yes, OK, uh, what can I say? Uh, <laughs> uh, the, 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 the play is there, and well, you can do with it whatever you wish. Uh, of course, I have my own uh, vision of how it should be done. I directed myself the play a few times. Uh, and, uh, but every director has the right to take a, a play, and uh, so, so long as he doesn't falsify it totally, uh, uh, and, and discover another meaning of the play, so to speak. Uh, I, I, one of the most, of the strongest performances of the play, uh, the most powerful performances took place in Japan in 1995, uh, we went to see it at Nine I, and I spoke with the guys, the, the director and the, and the actors and the people who did the, the performance. It was a, a, a very, very, it was an excellent performance of the play. And I asked them, what does it mean to you, the play? And they said, listen, they opened it in Kobe, not in Tokyo, uh, like three or four months after the earthquake that ruined uh, a great part of the town of Kobe. And we went to Kobe to see the, uh, the show where when still you could see the, the residues or the remnants of what the earthquake has done to the town. And the, uh, the most interesting answer I got from them was from the director. He said to me, for us, the play is about 
a community that suffers a terrible catastrophe and has to find in itself the forces to overcome the catastrophe and to continue to function as a human community. And he said, by finding a center of solidarity with itself. I said, OK, I never thought uh, that this was the meaning of the play, but I, I could accept it. And, and uh, uh, so I, I must say that for me, uh, if a director and a group of actors, they find a, a new meaning in uh, a play that I've written, I can only uh, uh, no, uh, bless them and, and uh, thank them for doing it. Yes, this is my attitude, at least. I, I am not a fanatic of uh, keeping uh, only one possible interpretation of a play of mine. Not at all. Yeah. I'd love to also open it up if uh, not only questions, but if, if I'd like to, to throw a question uh, at you, which is, uh, has, has there been a moment in your community or in your lives where art has acted as a, as a form of resistance? If you can think of any, or if that's something you'll think of as you go home, but that's just <laughs> a thought to, to put out there. Great. Thank you. Um, two thoughts on that. One, um, I'm writing a senior thesis that has nothing to do with this subject at all, but someone else is writing um, a satirical piece, which is sort of resistance to, um, I guess, things that they see as wrong um, in like an academic setting, which is interesting. But I actually had a question um, in regards to, you've referenced the fact that this subject matter is so difficult, and you've called it like impossible uh, theater. And I'm wondering how it was originally received like your work? I didn't understand the, I didn't really well understood the question. Oh, how did people react to it? Well, yeah, uh, the, 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 on the opening, ni opening night in Haifa, in, in Israel at the time, in 84, uh, we had, well, the, the, the the, the, the performance was followed immediately by a, an open discussion on the stage. And uh, there were on the stage uh, a representative of the partisans, a partisan, an ex-partisan whose name was Haika Grossman. Um, she was a member of the Israeli parliament at that time. And there were uh, other ex-partisans. And uh, there was a historian, and there was a woman who was running a shop of delicatessen in Tel Aviv. Her name was Dobka Waldhorn, who was also a survivor of the Vilna Ghetto. And uh, Haika Grossman, the member of parliament and the partisan, who was a very, very, uh, I would say, charming person, and an intellectual and everything, and a uh, uh, also a um, committed politician and so on, she uh, kind of criticized me. She said, why bring to the stage uh, these tangos uh, that were composed in the ghetto? Okay, but is this what you want to show the youth of today, uh, the youngsters of today, that people in the ghetto, they uh, sang and danced tango? And then uh, she said, and why bring a character of Weisskopf. Weisskopf in the play is a Jew who was a, a kind of a tailor before the war. And uh, in the ghetto, he had the idea uh, to open a workshop uh, for a sweatshop for repairing uh, German uniforms and laundering them and repairing them so that it will provide working jobs for people in the ghetto because whoever had a working permit, uh, his life was uh, ensured to a certain extent more than the life of someone who did not have any employment. And Weisskopf opened that uh, workshop, that laundry, and could uh, provide jobs for 150 people in the ghetto, but he became a millionaire overnight uh, because uh, he took uh, whoever people flocked, they wanted to get a job in that uh, uh, enterprise. So he made them pay. 
whoever wanted to get a job in his uh, enterprise had to pay some, I don't know, a certain uh, sum of money. And people paid with the best of what they had. And he became a millionaire over, overnight. And Krug uh, describes it in his diary. And I bring the character of Weisskopf in the play. And because he became a very rich man in the ghetto, Krug calls him the caliph of the ghetto, the caliph of the ghetto. And he describes him that now people listen to him all of a sudden. And the man is a group that describes him in Yiddish as a grober Jung. I don't know if you know what it is. A grober Jung means a, a bully. Yeah, a man who is uh, not uh, very clever, not very bright, so to speak. And, but he says he presides there, he sits in his hotel, in his uh, armchair, and people come to ask him advice because he is rich. And we have that example now, you know, uh, all over the place. <laughs> and uh, I bring him in a play, and uh, in the play he comes to the theater, he preaches morals to the actors and tells them, what, what, how they should behave, and why? And he says, why are you whining, why are you crying, this is not the way you should do, etc., etc. He, he has a, his ideas about what theater should be, and he is in the, in the play. And she said, why bring a character like Weisskopf? What has he got to do? She said, we defended the Jewish uh, um, um, uh, honor. And this man, what did he symbolize? And what did he defend? And why bring him to the stage? And then Dobka Waldhorn, the woman who owned the delicatessen shop in Tel Aviv, by the way, a non-kosher uh, delicatessen shop, uh, she said, Chaika, you are a survivor of the of first class survivor because you were a partisan and you uh, saved our honor. She said, I am a third class survivor. I did not save our honor. I didn't save even my parents. I didn't save anybody. I saved myself. And that's all. And, she sa and then she described a, a terrible scene that took place on the day of the liquidation of the ghetto. I'm not going into the details of it. And everyone started to cry. It was <coughs> impossible to, uh, to uh, stay uh, untouched by what, what she told. And even the, the, there was a cameraman of the Israeli television, and uh, he stopped shooting, and his camera <laughs> went to the ceiling, so to speak, because he was crying too. So this was the reaction to the play when it opened. There were c controversies. There were people who uh, criticized me for bringing these facts to the stage and, and depicting the life of the ghetto not according to the uh, already uh, well-established and accepted narrative, which was uh, already considered as the right way to tell the story. And by the way, I was attacked by Elie Wiesel. When the play opened in New York, Elie Wiesel uh, wrote an article in the New York Times and criticized me, again, for bringing uh, to the stage stories or characters and uh, elements that should not be probably shown on the stage. But what are, I answered uh, what I could answer. And uh, many years later, I met Elie Wiesel at the Weizmann Institute in Rehovot. Both of us received their Dr. Honoris Causa uh, for some reason. <laughs> and uh, he was very friendly. And we, we talked, and he probably forgot what he wrote about the play at the time. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, these were the reactions, if you... <laughs> in and in Germany? Very interesting. Well, uh, the uh, opening night in Berlin is some, something which, uh, for me, is unforget unforgettable. Uh, it was, uh, I, as I said before, it was an outstanding production. Uh, an outstanding production, what Peter Tzadek did there. It was tinged with uh, uh, German expressionism, but in, a, in the right way. He used all the means of uh, expression of theater in order to bring it to the stage. When it was over, there was a moment of total dead silence, and uh, which lasted, I don't know, for I can't uh, now uh, exactly evaluate. And then they broke out uh, in, uh, in a storming uh, applause, which lasted, I don't know, for something like 20 minutes. Uh, they didn't stop. I had to, to take a curtain call together with Peter Tzadek, and he was 
uh, overwhelmed. And he was a man who had a lot of experience in the theater, so he said to me, uh, at a certain point when we were uh, backstage, he said, uh, these in verrückt, they are uh, crazy. <laughs> Uh, they went out of their mind. And this was the kind of reaction there. It was an explosion. Now, uh, an irrational explosion also. And uh, later, I, I had um, encounters with the German audiences because the play was done in many, many, many theaters throughout Germany. And young people told me that what shocked them in the play was the character of Kittel, of the Nazi officer. They said to me, we saw uh, the guy, and he's a friend of ours. We know him. Uh, he's not a stranger. Uh, and they said, uh, we were used to, uh, to be shown the Nazi officer as a monster, as an extraterritorial creature, as something that, an extraterrestrial creature, someone who has nothing to do with us. And all of a sudden, you come and you bring us a kittle uh, who, is, who looks like us, who has our mentality, has our sense of humor, has our... And uh, they were shocked by the, by, the, by the fact that the Nazi officer was all, all of a sudden presented to them as someone whom they knew uh, from their uh, uh, human uh, milieu. Yeah, so this was the, uh, these were parts of the reactions in Germany. Uh, yeah, and well, yeah, that, that was uh, one of the reactions there. There were other reactions too. There, there was a, 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 a Jewish uh, essayist, a, a Broder, a very bright Henrik essayist, Broder. yeah, Henrik Broder, who wrote an article saying the right play for the wrong audience. <laughs> saying uh, the play is right, but the audience is wrong. I mean, the German audience is the wrong audience. They say that this, the play shouldn't be shown to that audience. And I argued with him. I know uh, Henrik Broder personally, and I said to him, I'm not selectioning uh, my audience. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, <laughs> the audience, uh, I can offer the play, and the, the audience makes of it what he can make, what they can make, what they can make of it. And this is it. This is my attitude also in the theater. I don't think that it's the job of a playwright or a director or to select the audience. I, I'm against it totally. We yeah. can certainly say today that we had the right audience. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I would like to thank the McFarland Center for hosting us at Holy Cross, and I'd like to thank Joshua Sobel and all of you for your engagement with this very topical, timely subject. So thank you all so much for coming.